This is Channel Attitude. Your voice. Your right. Your freedom. This is Vince Russo's The Brand. I told you about strawberry fields, man. You know the place where nothing is real, man. Well, here's another place you can go. Where everything flows. Looking through the glass on yons. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Vince Russo. This is a little ditty that we call Glass Onions. I record this every Sunday morning. It is the 19th of June. It is 2022. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, I told you this show could be about everything and anything. Uh, And a lot of it is going to be based on topics that I am interested in. And uh, we went heavy, man. We went heavy the last couple of weeks. We went very heavy with the son of Sam. So I decided to go a little lighter today. I decided to uh, tackle a subject that I think would be a little bit of fun. We are going to look at the top 10, 12 shows in television history that jumped the shark. We're going to talk about why they jumped the shark, when they jumped the shark. I am going to tell you what jump the shark means uh, if you are not familiar with the term. Allegedly, John Heim of the uh, Howard Stern Show came up uh, with the term, believe it or not, jumping the shark. And uh, where he got that from will make sense to you in a minute. We're going to lighten up a little bit. Man, I was going to do a deep fake show today. I saw some amazing, amazing deep fake videos yesterday, a lot of them involving Bill Hader that like creeped the shit out of me, bro. We're going to talk about that next time. You know, I I don't want to get heavy again uh, this week, so I want to keep it light. So, bro, let's look at what jumping the shark exactly means. Then we're going to look at some of the television shows, and I'm, I'm going to add some of my own. And I would love you to tell me what what television shows you think uh, jump the shark and how and when. And you can contact me at officialvinceruso at gmail.com. Now, let me tell you first, first of all, what it means. Jumping the shark describes the moment a television show begins a decline in quality. Wow, we, we, we should look at Raw, man. Man, I got to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, Raw jumped the shark when Russo and Ferrara left, bro. That's when Raw jumped the shark. That's when Raw wasn't Raw anymore, if you want to get down to the facts, but this ain't about me in it. Jumping the shark describes a moment a television show begins a decline in quality. Here are 11 shows that jumped the shark, and they jumped it real good. Jumping the shark is an idiom used to describe the moment a television show begins a decline in quality signaled by a particular scene or episode in which the writers use some type of gimmick in an attempt to keep viewers interested. Wow, could the raw gimmick have been the week after we left? Uh, Davey Boy Smith took a bump in some type of dog shit. Could Could that have been the moment that we're talking about? We've all had a beloved series that, for one reason or another, just couldn't hold our attention for much longer. The longer a series is on the air, the more likely it is to resort to these kinds of cheap gimmicks. It's sad and makes us wish it were easier for TV series to quit with grace instead of milking the property for every last drop. So let's look at uh, let's look at the 11 TV shows that jump the shark, and I will add some of my own. Now, some of these I watched and some of them I didn't, but I'm going to talk about them anyway, because you may have. Uh, The first one I'll never forget, man. Happy Days literally jumping the shark. This is where the name came from. Happy Days is credited for a great many things, most notably for giving us the Fonz, possibly the coolest character ever introduced to television. Unfortunately, its other lasting legacy is birthing the place Jump the Shark. 
During the fifth season of the show, the character of Fonzie is seen water skiing in a leather jacket and to prove his courage, accepts a a challenge to jump over a confined shark in order to prove his bravery. Now, the problem with this episode is twofold. Firstly, the early success of Happy Days had to come from the show being relatable to the audience. Well, you hear Al Snow talk about that all the time. This was seen as a moment so outrageous that it broke away from this easy formula. Secondly, the character of Fonzie had been secondary to begin with, but this moment was seen by many as the moment that the focus began to shift away from the core characters of the Cunningham family and onto Fonzie himself. The show continued for a further seven years after this point, but it's widely accepted that this was the moment it began to derail from a quality standpoint. Yes, man, I remember that show vividly. Fonz jumping the shark in the uh, leather jacket. Uh, it was bad, uh, bro. It was bad, but um, unbelievable that uh, Happy Days went on for seven more seasons after that. That's unbelievable. This one I remember as well. The Brady Bunch, when the creepy cousin joined the family. Are there are a lot of you out there as old as me. Remember the Brady Bunch? Remember Oliver? I remember this vividly. The Brady Bunch was considered to be the last of the old-fashioned sitcoms revolving around a blended or reconstituted family. The show made good use of the many themes and elements that made primetime comedies relatable at the time. The episodes focus on typical preteen and teenage themes such as sibling rivalry, puppy love, character building, and responsibility. In season five, in an effort to fill the gap of a young child in the family, the youngest being 12 at this point, so the Brady kids had grown up. So there's no longer a young kid that we can Google Gaga over. The producers introduced the character of Cousin Oliver. Seen by the fans as an interloper, he was never accepted, and even the producers admitted that his presence had thrown the show off balance. He only appeared in the final five episodes of season five, which proved to be the series' final season as ABC canceled The Brady Bunch. The term Cousin Oliver has since been used to describe a younger character brought in to save a show from a cancellation. Man, I wonder if, uh, like me, I wonder if, Cousin Oliver is is hearing after all these years, uh, you kill the Brady Bunch. I wonder if people are are tweeting him that in 2022. Now, guys, I'm going to be honest with you. This this show, I did not see. I know of it, but I did not watch it. But I know it was very, very, very popular at the time. So perhaps there was a a, a bunch of you that watched it. Heroes. And uh, this article is saying that heroes jump the shark in season two. Let me give credit to this article too, bro. Um, I am reading this article on Screen Rant by Fred Blunden. Fred Blunden. Want to make sure I give credit where credit is due. Heroes was, believe it or not, a phenomenon when it first hit our screens. It's comic book inspired storytelling, overlapping narratives, and real world settings made it huge. The cast and characters came from a variety of walks of life, from cops and watchmakers to Senate wannabes. For a show about people developing superpowers, it was surprisingly relatable. The climax of the first season met with mixed reviews. For some, seeing the whole cast come together for a showdown with the villain, uh, Silar was a huge payoff. For others, the question of what happened to the Petrelli brothers felt like there was still too many questions left unanswered. Then season two happened. Like the first season, it started slow. For a lot of fans, though, this was a mistake. There were few answers to some of the biggest unanswered questions. More than that, though, it didn't feel like a continuation of the energy of the last uh, several episodes of the first season. The main threat was a virus, which made it seem less impactful than the nuclear bomb of the first season. I don't know, bro. That's funny, man. Talking about a virus. I know Heroes was many, many, many years ago, and they're talking about it was less impactful than the uh, nuclear bomb of the first series. I don't know if that would be the truth today. By the end of season two, there had been some good moments, but for many, the damage was done. 
Also, there was the slight problem of a, a writer's guild strike, which caused production to su shut down and season two to finish up early. By the time season three rolled around, the decline in quality increased. A different writer every few weeks meant the storylines were quickly abandoned and character arcs never seemed to develop. Man, what does that sound like? An obsession, an obsession with trying to repeat the success of season one and as a result, never really growing as a show. Kept heroes from achieving any more. By the time it was canceled, many fans were glad to say goodbye and not that many turned back into the recent Heroes Reborn event series. You know, it's interesting because as I read some of these, I did not, uh, like I said, I did not watch Heroes. It might be interesting to go back and watch the show. Smallville, I know a lot of Smallville fans out there, Superman, when Lex left, Smallville was a pretty smart idea. Tap into the teen angst genre that was pop popular at the time. Dawson's Creek, we're looking at you. And mix it up with a young Superman origin story. It was a show that appealed equally to young men and women. In its first few weeks, it didn't touch on many of the comic book villains and instead tended to go with the freak of the week. Formula made popular by Buffy the Vampire Slayer with the frenemy relationship between young Clark and Lex as the backbone of the show. The quality varied over the years. Some seasons had some serious high points of pure comic book excitement. Others felt a little too forced when the seriously underrated Michael Rosenbaum, Lex Luthor, called it a day. The show lost one of its biggest draws. That happens quite a bit, man, when a character leaves. And we're going to talk about that. We're definitely going to talk about that later on. Some later seasons managed to recapture some of the fun in the show's early years, but once it shifted focus from Smallville to Metropolis, it ceased to be young Superman and became Superman. Except Superman, in all his glory, didn't appear until the final episode. Even then, we never did get to see him in full uniform like we'd been waiting a decade for. So a lot of you Smallville fans out there, you can tell me uh, if that was the moment that Smallville jumped the shark. I know it had a very, very, very long run. Enterprise, the, oh my God, X-I-N-D-I, x, -I -N -D -I, x attack, the x -I -N -D -I attack. Enterprise never got the same following that its predecessors had. Shifting to a prequel was always going to be problematic as any new elements were going to be met with the same response from fans. Why have we never heard of this race planet idea before? This was never more of a problem than when the alien ex Indy attacked Earth and killed millions. Presumably, this would be an event in Earth's history as massive as World War I, II, and Three put together. Yet, in all the years of Kirk, Picard, Cisco, and Janway, it was never even mentioned. You'd think at least once something as massive as a thousand 9-11s would get a footnote in one of Data's holodeck adventures. When the reboot button was hit again with 2009 Star Trek movie, it was wisely placed in an alternate timeline. This meant that just because Scotty survived to be an old man before doesn't mean he'd be safe now. The timeline was able to unfold completely differently and didn't need to fit with what had gone on before. Now, the next two I am very, very familiar with. I would agree with uh, both of them. Roseanne winning the lottery, man. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. This was a huge jump the shark moment. Uh, man, you know, Roseanne for its time was cutting edge. Uh, it was dangerous. Great, great writing on the show. Great character development. Great storylines. However, then Roseanne and the Connors won the lottery. Roseanne was one of the biggest comedies of its era. It was unique for having an in-your-face style of comedy and revolved around a working mother as a central voice of the show instead of focusing on the male characters. One of the things that made the show a success was that both the parents were normal, blue-collar workers. There was no perfect housewife style character. Both parents were noticeably overweight. Roseanne's husband was played by John Goodman, but it was rarely mentioned. For much of its first season, Roseanne was the number one show in America. 
And its first five years, it never left the top five. Man, Roseanne, bro, was wildly popular. I don't know if you guys remember. It was it was way over. Roseanne jumped the shark in the final season. The Connors won the state lottery and suddenly became worth over $100 million. All traces of relatability were gone, and the show was mercifully put out of its misery soon after. Absolutely, bro. Um, that was horrible, man. That was horrible. I, rem- I remember the character uh, who played Ernest. Remember all those Ernest movies, Ernest Goes to Camp and all that? Uh, he, he, he was brought in as a character. It was horrible, bro. It was, it was horrible, horrible. Two and a half men, Charlie Sheen leaving, winning for a show about a guy that inexplicably got a, got any woman he wanted, despite terrible taste in just about everything. Two and a half men was huge. America's biggest comedy in years and went from strength to strength for most of its early run. Then it hit a snag in 2011 after fierce contract negotiations over salaries. Well, I cannot believe that was 10 freaking years ago. 10 years ago with the winning and the tiger blood and all that stuff. Uh, And Charlie Sheen entering rehab for the third time in a year, production was suspended. After several bizarre, angry interviews and online and tirade by Sheen towards producer Chuck Lorre, the last eight episodes of the 2011 season were abandoned and the show looked like it had lost its leading man. It had. Sheen's character, Charlie Harper, was killed off screen. In May 2011, Ashton Kutcher was announced to be joining the show as new character Walden Schmidt, replacing Sheen as the lead. Despite continuing for a few more years, the show declined in quality steadily with several cast changes and even more outlandish storylines. In a finale that divided the fan base, Charlie Harper was seen to be alive and returned to confront his brother and imposter Walden only to be killed by a falling piano winning. Uh, Yes, I remember uh, that. Uh, I was not a big fan of Two and a Half Men at the time. I have watched it in reruns and syndication. But uh, yeah, there was a... um, there was a huge uh, difference between the Charlie Sheen character and the Ashton Kutcher character. Man, sometimes you just got to end shit, you know, man? Sometimes you just got to end it. Uh, The X-Files, when Mulder left, I I did not watch The X-Files, but I've heard about this. I've I've heard about the show was basically over when Mulder left. Initially, a cult hit, The X-Files quickly became a mainstream favorite, tapping into pre-millennium tension and distrust the government in the wake of numerous scandals. The X-Files found an enormous fan base. Man, I, I, I would like to go back and watch this show. Much of the show's success came from the on-screen chemistry between the two main characters, Mulder, the emotional believer in the paranormal, and Scully, the skeptical scientist. After the 1998 film, fans began to criticize the show for a lack of coherence in planning the overriding invasion plot. Despite this, the show still had several great standalone episodes that were as good as the early years. The show jumped the shark when Mulder, David Duchovny, was abducted by aliens at the end of season seven. While in many ways the search for Mulder revitalized the show, the narrative began to wander, and by the end of the season, it was clear that the once most imaginative show on TV was losing its imagination and had run out of ideas. Wow, that's interesting, man, because if the star of the show got abducted by aliens, you you would have to believe uh, that the writers knew where they were going, But because uh, I would like to see that. Now, this I know. The next couple I watched, Lost Season 3, The Flash Forward. I would love to talk to Jeff Lane about this. After a massive hit from the beginning, Lost was a phenomenon. Throughout its run, it was one of the most popular shows on worldwide television. The premise initially seemed simple. A plane crashes on a remote island, and the survivors struggle to stay alive and try to find help. Quickly, things became much more complicated, and the plot becomes convoluted very quickly. The island contained many mysteries, and the show took incredible twists and turns. One of the key elements of the early seasons was the use of flashbacks to fill in the characters' backstories. 
In the last episode of season three, however, the series introduced a surprise flash forward to life after the island, showing what happened to the Oceanic Six after they made their way home. I remember this, bro. And this was an absolute shocker because we had been telling stories about the uh, the survivors, alleged survivors, leading up to this swerve. I mean, this was a swerve of of all swerves. We went to a backstory and we jumped ahead to time after the island. This was a big swerve. I remember this. Though the idea was initially exciting, its follow-up in season four began to attract a lot of criticism. After three years, there was little explanation to any of the mysteries that had been there since day one, and the audience was getting restless. Several new characters were introduced and received almost universal derision. There was a noticeable drop in audience enthusiasm at this point, and the show failed to garner the love it had enjoyed in the early. Yeah, bro, it did get kabuki-ish for me. I know it never did for Jeff, but it did uh, It did get kabuki-ish for me a little bit. Uh, I watched it all, though, bro. I watched every episode of every season of Lost. Dallas, bro, this was, uh, I, this was my college years, man. I'll never forget this. Dallas, the shower dream sequence. When Dallas premiered in 1978, holy shit, bro. I can't believe it was that long ago. 17 years. Uh, I was 17 at the time. It was an instant TV phenomenon. Initially focusing on the marriage of Bobby Ewing, the show quickly began to shift its attention to JR. JR's dirty business dealings and scheming became a hallmark of the show and became one of the most successful shows on TV. Over the years, uh, a behind the scenes creative change resulted in Patrick Duffy's character, Bobby, being killed off in the series uh, A finale. Season nine saw a, soda, a, a noticeable change in the general tone of the show. And the fans reacted by vocally showing their dissatisfaction with the direction things were going. By season 10, things had escalated to such a degree that the producers decided to completely undo the entire previous season by explaining it as a dream had by the character Pam, who was Bobby's wife, while Bobby was in the shower. The events of uh, the ninth season were completely erased and show hit reset, but the damage was done and viewers lost interest in this once great show. A few attempts at rebooting, notwithstanding, the show died in 1991. The infamous shower scene remains one of its lasting legacies. Yeah, man. The shower scene killed Dallas, bro. Uh, There's no doubt about that. If you guys are familiar with this show, this was this was a uh, you've got to be kidding me moment. Bro, I'll never forget that show for uh, Victoria Principal, who played Pamela Ewing, Bobby's wife. Oh my God, I had I had such a crush on Victoria Principal. Okay, number three, Prison Break. When they broke out of prison, I, I've not I've not seen Prison Break. Another high ca- high concept show in the two thousands, Prison Break, was another instant hit. The story of the two brothers, one sentenced to death for a crime he did not commit and the other who devises an elaborate plan to help his brother escape prison and clear his name drew in big audiences. At the end of the first season, the brothers, along with several others, escape in a tunnel dug beneath the walls of the prison. The second season followed a very different format and met with mixed reactions. Some praised the change in directions, feeling that they couldn't stay in the prison forever. Others felt that the show had become too different to the original formula and had become a show about fugitives as opposed to prisoners. At the end of season two, several prisons were recaptured and imprisoned in Panama. Despite running for a further two seasons, most viewers agreed that the show declined in quality sometime during season two. Okay. We got the last couple, bro. Then I'm going to add my own. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to add a couple of the biggest ones that I can't believe are here. Moonlighting when they got together. Remember this, bro? Uh, Sybil De- uh, Sybil Shepherd and Bruce Willis. Moonlighting was a definite will they, won't they show with most of the attention being given to the chemistry between co-stars Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepherd. The show was a mixture of drama, comedy, and romance and was considered to be one of the first successful examples of comedy, drama, or dramedy. Despite being a massive hit, once the two leads entered into a relationship, the show was in trouble. 
While the investigations of the private detective agency had been central to the show, along with successful gimmicks such as their breaking the fourth wall, the main audience draw was waiting for the couple to give into the sexual chemistry between them. When the couple finally got together in season three, they were behind the scenes compl complications, which added to show problems. Sybil Shepping was off having twins, so they had to shoot her scenes in advance, causing much fewer scenes with her and Bruce Willis. Also, Willis was making Die Hard. When that was a massive success, his interest in making a weekly show waned due to his blooming movie career. That was a, that was a big show, bro. Uh, Moonlighting was very hot at the time. Okay, here's number one. Interesting. Seinfeld, when Larry David left, considered by many to be the greatest show of all time, Seinfeld was a brainchild of Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld. The definitive show about nothing, Seinfeld wasn't still is one of the most successful shows of all time. While never faltering in the ratings, indeed, viewership rose through its run. Seinfeld is considered to have jumped a shark when Larry David left after season seven. While he left on good terms, and he did, indeed he came back to write the final two years later, his genius was missed in the last two seasons. While there was no uh, specific moment on screen, the show's once magic dialogue was a little less polished and the quality of the writing lacked what had once made it so perfect. Bro, I don't know if I agree with that, man. Listen, I'm a big Seinfeld fan. I'm a big Larry David fan. I don't think the show got weaker uh, when he left. That's just my opinion. There's some other ones here, bro. Will, Will and Grace, uh, guest stars galore. I, I guess while while Will, Will and uh, Grace was winding down, they tried to fill in the gaps by bringing in a ton of guest stars. The Cosby Show, Olivia joins the get cast. Again, whenever a child star joins an already established show, you know there's trouble on the horizon. Raven Simone played Olivia. ER, the helicopter hell. ER had a lot of gimmicks uh, through the show's run, but in the early seasons, you could chalk it up to writers taking advantage of a fantastic cast and fresh ideas. However, in the later scenes, it became clear that the writers weren't sure what to write about anymore or what to do with certain character, especially Robert Romano and Paul McCrane. In the season nine premiere, the surgeon loses his arm to a helicopter blade. That event and subsequent recovery storyline was actually handily, handled fairly well. The arm was reattached and he went through rehab only for it to never regain proper motor functions and he decided to amputate it. Wow. I, I, <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. Gray's Anatomy, the musical episode. Uh, they're citing Seinfeld, the series finale. Felicity, when Felicity cut her hair. Alias, my name is in Michael Vaughn. The first two seasons of Alias is a perfectly scripted spy drama. Uh, it's obvious that a show like this would have an expiration date and viewers became wise to the fact starting in season three with the introduction of Vaughn's wife. Certain curveballs can reinvigorate a series, but by the time the season four finale rolled around, it was clear the writers were scrounging for storyline scrapes. In the episode, Starcross Love is Sydney, Jennifer Gardner, and Vaughn are now engaged and appear to be a picture perfect couple until Va Vaughn drops a bombshell that he isn't who he appears to be. And the two are swiftly hit by an oncoming vehicle. Season five then continued with more convoluted mythology, and the few viewers that stuck around were mostly doing so out of nostalgia. Then they go on to talk about Roseanne and Happy Days. Guys, it is so hard to keep a show good. I, I, I would have thought, bro, Blacklist, when Elizabeth Keene was killed, I would have thought that would have been the jump the shark moment. I would have thought that. But I got to tell you, I kind of enjoyed season nine. Uh, and now more characters are being written off for season 10. But... um. I don't believe that show has jumped the shark yet, even though it's been around for as long as it has. I will tell you of other store, uh, shows that jumped the shark that are not listed here, bro. There's a couple. All in the family, bro. Oh, my God. Seriously, th th that should be right there with jumping the with, with uh, Fonz jumping the shark. When Mike and Gloria left and then, and then Stephanie 
Archie's niece moved in. Oh, my God, bro. Forget it. It was over. Good night, Irene. I do not know how that is not on this list. That show should have ended when Mike and Gloria moved to California with baby Joey. Show over. Game over. When they brought in, I, I think the little actress's name was Danielle uh, Bravo. Brobo, Brasbo, some Frenchy name. Oh my God. Seeing Archie Bunker interact with a little kid. Wow. I don't, I have no idea how uh, that is not on that list. Bro, here's another one. And I hate to say this. I think James Spader did a, did a great job as uh, California. What was the first name? I can't remember. I think he did a great job in the office. I love, I love, I love, uh, I, I love him, bro. I think he did a great job, Spader. Robbie, California. Bro, office was over when Michael Scott left. Over. Over. Pull the plug. Over. Robbie, California. I love him, bro. I love James Spader. Love him, love him, love him. I thought he did a good job as Robbie, California. The show was never the same. They still had all the same cast there. Pam, Jim, Dwight Schrute, they were all there. But when Michael, when Michael Scott left, that show, in my opinion, without a doubt, jumped the shark. I can't believe that is not listed here. So that's a bunch of shows, bro, that have jumped the shark. I think, I think Raw jumped the shark when Russo and Ferraro left. Why ain't we on this list? Why aren't we on this list, bro? That's when the WWE Raw jumped the shark. But interesting, bro. Very, very interesting conversation. And bro, if you guys got some shows uh, that you think jumped the shark, let me know, bro. Let me know exactly when, what happened, and we could talk about it. Uh, I'm sure there are dozens and dozens and dozens of other shows uh, we did not discuss. I got to think about some of my all-time favorites. I know um, Andy Kaufman eventually left Taxi, but I think Christopher Lloyd picked up the slack. I'm, I'm just trying to think of some of my favorite shows, some classic, iconic television shows. When would they have jumped the shark? Think about it, guys. I'd love to get your feedback. We could do a follow-up on this show. If you know of any TV shows or feel they jumped the shark, I don't agree with the Seinfeld one. Uh, let me know at officialvinceruso at gmail.com. Next time, bro, we're going to go into deep fake, man. Send me videos, man. If you guys got any videos of deep fakes, send them to me, man. If they're good, I will play them on this very show. So it was a little lighter show today. I hope you enjoyed it. We had a little bit of fun. Uh, listen, man, for all you dads out there, man, happy, 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 happy Father's Day, man. God bless you all, man. guys. This has been Vince Russo. This has been Glass Onions. I'll see you next week.